I'm excited about our, our current series. It's, it's an important series, um, six lies that American Christians believe. And it's important that we get these lies corrected because these, these aren't lies that we can say, ah, you know, that's, that's not really a big deal. Let's, let's just agree to disagree there. These are, these are core issues that if we get wrong, it will have, it will have some devastating and, and eternal consequences. And last week, Chad started our series uh, with, the first, with the first lie that, that the Bible is not relevant. And again, the, these are, aren't lies that, that just the general population are believing. These are, these are lies that Christians, people who call themselves Christ followers, are, are believing. And yes, there are some Christians who believe that the Bible is irrelevant and can't always be trusted to speak to issues of the current culture. We started with this one because if, if the Bible supposedly is irrelevant, then, then the rest of this doesn't, doesn't matter. Okay, because we can, we can end this series now. Matter of fact, we can just kind of close our doors as a church and we can just make our way over to Allen Cafe and, and just flood them with people and, and just have a good time and just have a good breakfast. Because if, if, the, if our foundation isn't true, then, then it's over. And we started with that one because what we believe that the Bible is God's word to us. Matter of fact, it says this on our website. I don't know if you've ever gone to, you should, as a, as a member of this church or if you attend this church, you should go to our website and you should look at what we believe as a church. And here's what it says under what we believe about the Bible. It says that the Holy Bible was written by men, divinely inspired, and is God's revelation of himself to man. It is a perfect, it is a, gosh, I lost my plate, perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. Therefore, all scripture is totally true and trustworthy. It reveals the principles by which God judges us and therefore is and will remain to the end of the world the true center of Christian union and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions should be tried. All scripture is a testimony to Christ who is himself the focus of divine revelation. It's, it's not just a that's the quote on our website. It's not just a book with good stories. It's not a fairy tale with, with happy ending. It's not just an ancient document that no longer speaks to life today. Listen to that sentence again. It reveals the principles by which God judges us and therefore is and will remain till the end of the world the true center of Christian union and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions should be tried. In other words, it's, it's the standard. We know God because of the scripture that he's given us. We know Jesus, who Jesus is because of the scripture. We, we know what the life that he leads for us because of his, his holy word to us. It's the standard by which we live our lives. And if you missed last week, I, I, I encourage you to go back on our website and, and watch the service again. Listen, listen to, to Chad's message because that's the foundation of which we build this, our truth. It's God's truth. And so... That's, that's where we start. And so today we're, we're kicking off with, uh, with lie, or starting with lie number two. Now, do, do any of you watch TV? Raise your hand if you watch TV. Okay, good. Most of you. Not all of you. How many of you have more than one TV in your home? Raise your hand. It's okay. How many of you have one in your bedroom? Raise your hand. You bad people. No, I'm just kidding. We have one too. Yeah. You watch TV. I remember growing up. Okay, this, this was, I remember growing up when you had to walk to the TV to change the channel. I remember, man, those were tough times back then. Because, you know, and especially when you were a kid growing up in those days, guess who was the remote? You were as the kid. My dad would go, so he'd call, I don't know, he'd call me all kinds of names, but he'd say, boy, get up and change that channel. <laughs> yes, father. And so I'd walk up and, you know, and fortunately, when I grew up, there was only about three or four channels. And, you know, you had to, you had to twist that thing and get it in there. And I know some of you are going, Hush, boy, I, when we grew up, there was just radio and blah, blah. And I know, I'm just talking about me when I grew up. Um, but but the, there, wasn't that many, there wasn't that many shows. And you only had, you know, four or five channels. And here's the crazy thing. At about midnight, all the channels would go dark. Because they would, they, you'd get to the end of, we've now come to the end of the programming day. And they would play the national anthem. And, and some of you kids, you know, under the, I don't know what age, probably under 30, maybe even older, you, You've never seen this, but the, the, the channel actually shut off. They'd play the national anthem, and, 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 so, and you'd see the, the, the F-16 or 14 flying through the country and the flag waving and, and Statue of Liberty, and, and so that's just how they ended the day. And then the channels, 
they, they would turn off. And it would just be fuzz or it would just be a black screen. So if you were up past midnight, you couldn't sleep for some reason, and you wanted to watch TV, you were out of luck. You had to do something crazy like read a book or, or, or you know, to try to find some other way to, to, to kill the time. But now, it's so different. Okay, you, you, it's, TV is amazing. There, there are hundreds of channels that you can choose from. Everything that you can think about. You know this list. There's sports and news and cooking and history and shopping and, and shows about selling houses, channels about fixing houses. There's religious channels. There's movie channels. You realize that you don't even have to go out of your house now to, to get a movie. Remember back in the olden days when you had to go to a video store like Blockbuster? Remember way back then where you had to go to that and you'd, you'd go and there was an exchange of something? No, it's on demand now. You just, you just hit a big uh, yellow button on your remote and you can pick any movie that you want to that they have there and you can watch it. It's amazing. You can record your shows and watch them later. You can, you don't have to, you can record a show and then watch it commercial free. You can just fast forward to the commercials. Man, if, if I knew who the man or woman was that, that invented that the recording, I, I'd give them a hug right now and, and take them to the lunch because that's so wonderful. You know, the, the commercial free show. I mean, you it's, and here's the crazy thing. You don't even need a TV anymore. You don't. You can watch TV now on your computer. You can watch it on your phone. Imagine that. This right here, I have the capability of turning my, going to my, TV, to my TV and watching my shows. Some of you are already doing that right now because you've just given up on me and saying, what in the world is he talking about? I have a point, and here's the point. Here's the point. You know what? And, and no, Well, first, don't let me forget this. The thing that I love about the TV the most is the remote, okay? Because you have the power with the remote. You can change channels. You can can change channels all you want to. Uh, If you don't like the the, the show that's on, you can change it. Change as often as you want to. Even if other family members are in the room watching the show, you can still change it. And you can just keep going and going and going. I remember there's an episode of Everybody Loves Raymond where Frank Barone, his dad, figured out that if he just put a piece of tape over the remote and he just would change automatically. And he just put it on his chest and he said, look, my hands are free to eat things. And you have to change. I mean, you can just constantly change the channel. If you don't like it, you change it. If you're bored with it, you change it. If, if it's an offensive show to you, you change it. And we just, we just have that remote. I mean, and, and here's what I'm getting at. When it comes to truth, when it comes to God's truth, you know what people want? People want a remote. You know why? So they can change it. They can change it. Some people, they don't like it. They don't like God's truth, and so they want to change it to a different channel because that truth doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit how I see my world. It goes against how I think God should act or what he should do. Um, God, he set these standards for truth, and because it's uncomfortable to us, then we just want, we want to change the channel. We want to find something that we like, something that we prefer, something that feels better, something that makes sense to us, and we, something that we say, well, this is how life should work. This, this makes me happy. This feels right. And instead, instead of allowing God to mold us and to shape us, to shape our attitudes, our actions, our thoughts, Instead of allowing him to mold us into, into what he wants us to be, we, we just decide, hey, mm, I'm going to change the channel. Why? Because it's, we think it's too hard to live a life that God has set out. It doesn't make sense to me. My view on things are different. Um, I, I don't really see the world that way. And God, honestly, the, most of our world doesn't see the world that way anymore. That's, that's, not, that's not what our favorite author says anymore. And that's, you know, most of America doesn't, doesn't think that way. And I don't want to believe that because that might require some changes on me. That might require some changes on how I act, some relationships that I have, the things that I do uh, at my job. Uh, I, might, I might be seen as, uh, as, you know, intolerant. I might be seen in, in a different light. And so, God, I just, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to do that. But here's something that we have to understand as Christ followers Truth is based on, not on what we feel, think, or believe. Truth, it comes from God and His Word, and it's truth no matter what we think or what we feel about it. It's, it's always true. And that's something that we have to understand as followers of Christ, that we don't, we don't get a remote where we can change the channel to something that we want, something that's different, something that, that suits us but that God's truth is always true, whether we think it is or not. And one of the beliefs that some Christians have, and it's a lie, 
that we have that, that we, that we have, to, we have to correct because if it's not God's truth, then, then it's a lie. But one of the lies that the people have bought into is, is that good people, and this are, these are Christian people have thought this and think this, good people go to heaven. Okay, good people go to heaven. And that sounds good, right? It makes sense. Why, why wouldn't a good person go to heaven? Why wouldn't God allow a good person into heaven? Why would a good God say no to a good person? That, that doesn't seem right to me. Um, I think God should, and, and I think God would allow a good person into heaven. That's, that, sounds, that sounds right to me. Yeah, good people. Good people go to heaven. I like that. I'm going to stop changing the channel. That's, I like that station. I like that truth. That, that's, that's what I'm going to go with. But here's a hard truth for some of us. If we don't believe that good people go to heaven, then that may mean that some of the good people in our lives that we knew aren't in heaven. Or some of the good people in our lives today, who if they were to die right now, that they wouldn't, they wouldn't be in heaven. And that's, that's a thought. We don't, want, we don't want to have that thought. That's not, that's not where we want to go. That doesn't feel right. That can't be true. I don't want that to be true. Change the channel. I want to believe something that helps me to feel better, that fits what I think, that fits what I believe, that fits how I want God to act and how I want God to be. I want it to fit this, so I want to change, I want to change the truth. But let me, let me give you, and this is in your outline, let me give you some problems with the whole idea that good people go to heaven. Here's, here's the first, and there's lots of them, but I'm, just, I'm going to give you some real quickly. The first one is this, it's, it's not biblical. Well, the idea of good people go to heaven, it's not, it's not in the Bible. We said in the first week that this is God's word to us and this God's word is true and God word, God's word is our standard. And nowhere in God's word does it say that good people go to heaven. In fact, it's in direct opposition to what God says in his word. And we'll talk more about that in, in a little bit. So it's not biblical. Here's the other thing. The problem with good people go to heaven. What's, what's good enough? What's good enough? And that's, that's why we have the, the scales up here drawn as a symbol for today's sermon. How do we know when the scale has, has tipped in our favor? How do we know if, if we measure up? How do we know that, that we've hit that mark? How do we know that, you know, did, did we go to church enough times? Was, was, was twice, twice a month? For, for most of my life, was that good enough? Or three times a month? Or, or was it that I had to go every day? Um, do, do, did, did you give enough money? Did you avoid enough, uh, enough of the rated R movies? Or, or you saw the ones that, that really, you didn't see the ones that were really, really bad, but you saw the ones that were, you know, it was just violence. It wasn't, you know, all that other stuff. Um, did, did, did you do your best to avoid, you know, horrible shows like The, the Bachelor and Dancing with the Stars? Just kidding, but not really. And, and did you... Did you say please and thank you enough? Did you, did you come under the limit of, of, uh, of cuss words that you said? You know, the, the, early in your life, you, you know, you let a few fly. But now that you're older, you've, you've, really, you've really cut that down. So was, what, did you come under the limit? Did, did, you, did you just tell little white lies? You know, lies that, that weren't that big. I mean, you, you didn't tell any big, big lies. But you just, you know, you just told little ones. Was, was, is that okay? Um, did, did you pray enough? Did you read your Bible enough? Did you go on enough mission trips? Did you tell enough people about God? Were, were you nice to your wife? Were you nice, supportive and nice to your wife, supportive and nice to your husband? Did you, did you always obey your parents? Were you always fair to your kids? Are, are, are you sure that when you were at work that you were always working and, and never really slacking off? Were all your social media posts positive and uplifting? I mean, that would knock out a bunch of you right there. But seriously, the, the question, with, the problem with good people go to heaven is how good is good enough? Who determines what enough is? Who determines where we need to focus our good efforts? I mean, I, I could have focused all my efforts over here on this because I thought this is what everyone wanted. This was what good was. But really, no, that you needed to do more in this area. Can I, and here's, can I lose ground if I do something that's not good. In other words, if, if I've, I've worked myself to here and I do something wrong on the way home, I mean, do I lose ground or do I just stay where I'm at? Is, is there a website that I can maybe monitor my current, 
my current uh, level of goodness? I mean, joking, but, but sort of not really. That's a huge problem with good, go to, good people go to heaven. How do, you, how do you know if you're good enough? There are many of the world religions that live in this tension. They're trying to work their way into what they call heaven. They're trying to earn God's love. And if you were to ask them, have you done enough? If they were being totally honest with you, probably most of them would say, I don't know. I hope so. I think so. But I don't know. And here's a, th- a third problem with that good people go to heaven, and, and it's an obvious one. It's the cross would be irrelevant. The cross would be irrelevant. If we could get to heaven by being good, then why in the world did Jesus have to suffer and die? Why did he have to go through the beatings and the humiliation and the agony and the torture and, and the nails? Why did he have to do that? Why did he have to suffer? What was the point? It seems like if being good got you into heaven, then it would be on us. Jesus would have been off the hook. The Apostle Paul talked about this in his letter to the Galatians. In Galatians 2.21, he says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, in other words, if if you could be good enough, gain your righteousness through doing good things, then Christ died for nothing. If we could get to God by doing good, then there's no need for what Jesus did. It was pointless. It was pointless. So the lie is good people go to heaven. Now let's talk about what's the truth. And in John chapter 14, verse 6, that's going to be our, our verse for today. And it's kind of it's, it's the launching pad where we're, going to, where we're going to jump off into talking about the truth. And uh, John's one of the Gospels. It's one of the four biographies of Jesus. It's in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Some of you know this. You don't have to open up your Bible because you've got it memorized. It's one of the ones you memorized a long time ago. And to set this up... Um, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's, he's, about, to, he's about to go to the cross. Uh, matter of fact, when he leaves here with them, he's going to the garden and at the Garden of Gethsemane where he'll be betrayed and he'll be arrested, and he'll be taken, and, and, and it's, it's the whole next 24 hours of, of the road to him going to the cross. And, and he's told them this, they're worried about this, and, and he, he says, listen, you, you don't need, don't be anxious, don't be afraid. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back for you, and you know where I'm going. And the disciples go, we don't, we don't really know where you're going, and how do, how, do we get, how do we get to where you're going? That's where we pick it up in John 14, 6. It says, Jesus said to him, this was Thomas who asked that question, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through good works. Make sure you guys are still awake. No, no one comes to the Father except through me. So the way to God is through Jesus Christ. He's saying, Thomas said, how do we get to where you're going? In other words, how do we get to God? How do we have that relate? He goes, that way to God is through me. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. That's the truth. And that's how we get to God. So here's what that means for us. So if, if the lie is good people don't go to heaven, or good people go to heaven, if that's a lie, good people go to heaven, well, then here's the truth, and it's, it's the next blank on your outline. Good people don't go to heaven, and you probably can fill this in. Forgiven people go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Ephesians 1, 7 says, He is so rich in kindness... And grace that he purchased, this is, they're talking about Jesus, uh, that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. So if you look at those, those, just those two verses, you, you will notice that there's nothing in there about us being good. Forgiveness comes from Jesus Christ. Our freedom from sin comes through Jesus, which leads us to our next point, is salvation is about what Jesus has done not what we do. Salvation is about what Jesus has done, not what we do. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. This is a, this is a, a real familiar passage to a lot of people. And it's a, if you've grown up in church, and it, and it says, I mean that you have been saved by grace through believing. You did not save yourselves. It was a gift from God. It was not the result of your own efforts, so you cannot brag about it. 
Now, don't miss that. Because some of you have heard that verse a bunch of times, when you hear something over and over and over, it can kind of lose its power, it can lose its meaning just because you kind of gloss right over it. But when, when you're, you got to understand, when, when Paul's writing this letter, he's talking, he's talking to believers who, who maybe are starting to get a little bit cocky and thinking, well, it was them. It was, you know, they're, they're believers because of the good works. And there's going to be other people that hear this who, who think that you have to be good in order to be loved by God. And there's a certain set of rules that you have to follow in order to be in God's good graces, in, in order to, to, to have his forgiveness. And there's also another group of people that might hear this letter who, who've been told you're not a part of God's people. You're not good enough to be considered God's people. So you will never, you will never, you will never be a part of God's kingdom. But listen to this again. It says, you did not save yourselves. It was a gift from God. It was not the result of your own efforts. It's not about what you do. It's about what Jesus has done. John 14, 6, if you go back, it said, Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through him. Jesus said, through me. It's through Jesus. It's through his death on the cross and his resurrection that makes life possible It was his effort on our behalf. And I love the last part of that verse where it says, so that you cannot brag about it. Look at that. So you cannot brag about it. No one, I can guarantee you, no one that's in heaven now and no one that will be in heaven in the future will ever say it was all me. No one is saying that. No one will be saying, did you like did you like that? Did you did you see how I saved myself? Man, I'm good. No one will ever say that. Why? Because that would never happen. Because it's completely impossible. We don't save ourselves. Titus 3.5 says, He, Jesus, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. He saved us. He saved us from sin. He saved us from separation from God for eternity. He made it possible for us to move from darkness into light. It was not because of works done by us in righteousness. In fact, look at the next point. It's because of what we've done. It's what we've done. This is exactly why we need Jesus. What we've done, you and I, is exactly why we needed Jesus to do what he did. Titus 3.3 3 says, For we too, listen to this, were once foolish, disobedient, misled, enslaved to various passions and desires, spending our lives in evil and envy, hateful and hating one another. It's not a good, it's not a good resume. Ephesians 2.13 says, But now, thanks to Christ Jesus, you who were once so far away, look at how it described us, we were so far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. God, because he is God, can have nothing to do with sin. So what is, what is sin? Sin is not measuring up to the standards that God has set. That there is, there is a way that God wants us to live, and we, we, have not, we have not done that. And the penalty for sin, the penalty for not living up to God's standard, is death. And I'm not just talking about a physical death, but I'm talking about an eternal death. The penalty for sin is to be separated from God forever. And sin, so sin means we cannot be with God in heaven. Why? Because there is no sin in heaven. We can't be with God in heaven. These two verses are just a couple of examples of the reality that we all face. And that reality is is that we are not perfect. We are not good enough. We've all missed the mark set by God. And look, you saw how that verse in Titus described us. Foolish, disobedient, misled, enslaved to various passions and desires, spending our lives in evil and envy, hating and hateful of one another. Ephesians passage says that we were far away from God. Being good, being good doesn't take away our sin. Being good doesn't save us from an eternal separation from God. Being good doesn't get us into heaven. It says when we were far away from God, but we were brought back. And how were we brought back? We were brought near, we were brought back by the blood of Jesus Christ. It was his death, his death, that paid the penalty for our sin. It was the shedding of his blood that paid the high price for our sin. Jesus gave his life in order to satisfy God's wrath 
against sin. Now, that word wrath, I don't want you to miss that word, okay? So think about it this way. An almighty, holy, perfect, all-powerful creator God unleashing his complete and total anger to the very things that destroyed the fellowship that we had with him, that he had with his people, the intimacy that he desired for us, the uninterrupted relationship that he created for us, that thing, sin, that messed all that up, he goes after it, and he goes after it with all of his might, all of his power. Why? Because sin is in direct opposition to God. Not big sin, not little sin, not, you know, this sin or that sin, all sin, big and small. It's in direct opposition. Matter of fact, sin is anti-God. And so here's a hard truth. You ready for it? Our sin, my sin, our sin puts us in opposition to God. It makes us, you and me, it makes us anti-God. Our sin. So what was rightfully ours, okay, the judgment, the just punishment, the deserved punishment... Jesus took for us. That wrath that was supposed to come at us, that wrath that we deserve, that wrath that that was a just punishment for our sins, Jesus took for us. He took on God's wrath so we wouldn't have to. He bore that punishment for our sins. And it's because of Christ that we can have forgiveness of sin. Our sins can be washed away and we can be in heaven with God one day, but we can also live today, today living our lives as victorious over sin because of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. Jesus did that for us. He took it. It was coming, it was something that had to be done, and it was something that we deserved because what we had done, right? Because of our sin. And Jesus said, I will take that. Father, I will take that for them so that they can have the benefits of me taking the wrath. And the benefit is forgiveness. The benefit is restoration. The benefit is eternal life, a relationship with God. But here's an important first step that we all have to take. Okay, and it's next, it's right there on your outline. It starts with the realization that we are all sick. Look at your neighbor and say, We're all sick. Say it like you mean it. We're all sick. Just say, You're sick. Don't even, don't even include you. Just tell them you're sick. No, I'm just kidding. But here's where I get that, okay? Here's where I say we're all sick. Mark 2, 16 through 17, it says, And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And there's, there's some huge irony in these verses. This, the Pharisees and, 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 and the people with the Pharisees, they, they were asking Jesus' followers this, why, why is he hanging out with those people? Doesn't he know who those people are? Doesn't he get the reputation of those people? Doesn't he understand what those people have done? Why is he hanging out with those people? When in reality... They are those people. The Pharisees, the group that, that, that saw themselves as religious, they, they are those people. They don't get it, but Jesus is talking directly about them. See, the Pharisees, saw, they saw themselves as good. They thought their position with God was based on their good deeds. They, were at, they, were, they went to the synagogue all the time. They were, they were doing regular prayer. I mean, you could set your clock by their prayers because they would, they, would, they would hit all of, always at the right time. They would, give, they would give their offerings. As a matter of fact, they, they would let it known that they were giving their offerings. On the outside, according to the Pharisees and according, probably according to people that saw them, they looked good. They looked like they were good. They looked like the scales were in their favor. And people looked at that and said, you know, I could never measure up to that. But on the inside, they were sick. And that's a horrible place to be when you're sick, but you think you're well. 
when you think you're close to God because of all the good that you've done, but in reality, you're far from him. We are all sick and we need a doctor. We're sinners and we need a savior. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All. Okay, that means me. That means you. That means everyone, anyone that you can think of. We've all fallen short. We're all sick. We're all broken. We're all sinners. All of us. And we all need a savior. And we can't fix this issue on our own. We can't. We, we can't be good enough. No amount of money, no amount of good works, church attendance, being nice during traffic, posting Bible verses on Facebook, forwarding the ridiculous emails that say, if you love God, then forward this a hundred times to all your friends and annoy them. Nothing we, we can do will ever, ever fix this problem. We're sinners. And the only solution to this issue is Jesus Christ. The only solution to this issue is Jesus Christ. Good people don't go to heaven. People who've asked Jesus for forgiveness and surrendered their lives to him, those people, those people go to heaven. And there's, there's good news. It's the last point in your outline. There's good news. Jesus' love, forgiveness, and new life is made available to everyone. Here's another verse that we read all the time, or we've met probably one of the first ones that you ever memorize, and you can say it really fast, but when you say it really fast, you can miss the meaning. Listen to it again. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever, 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 member of this church, not a member of this church, American, not American, white, not white, rich, not rich, Lonely, not lonely. Married, not married. Whoever believes in him shall not perish. In other words, shall not be separated from him forever because of our sin. That sin will be taken care of because what Jesus did. Shall not perish, but have eternal life. Have that uninterrupted fellowship with God. Have that relationship with him so that one day we will be with him, be with him in heaven. But for now, while we're living on this earth, we live for him now, allowing him to lead us, to guide us. That truth that I spoke with the kids talking about making decisions, we allow God to, to, to be the, the source for truth for our decisions and how we live our lives. We shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. What are those last two words? Through him. Not through good works. Not through church attendance. Not through through giving. Not through mission trips. Not through any of those things. Those are all great things and those are things that we should do. But what they should be is they should be responses to God's love and not in order to earn God's love because it doesn't work that way. We can't earn our way into heaven. Here's the great news. God knew what our sin, our disobedience, he knew what our rebellion and our selfishness would lead to. He knew it. And he knew that we could not fix it. So God being the loving and merciful God, but also being the just God because he had to take care of sin. God, here's the thing. God didn't just go and, okay, I forgive you. No biggie. Now, sin still had to be taken care of, and he knew we couldn't fix it, so he made a way. Jesus came to forgive our sins and to give us a brand new start. Jesus told us that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Our salvation is not earned. It's a gift of God through Christ Jesus. Are you good enough? Are you good enough? The Bible says no. None of us are. None of us are good enough, but thanks be to God that it's not up to us. We're saved because of Jesus' sacrifice for us. We go from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. We go from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of God. We go from the kingdom of death into the kingdom of life. And the only reason we get to change our address from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light is because of Jesus. Jesus moves us. Jeff talked about it earlier in a prayer that he led after the song. It's through adoption. You see, God took us from where where we were Because of Jesus Christ, and he gave us a new name. He gave us a new identity. He gave us a new address. He gave us us a new life. And so now we are with him in his kingdom. And it's it's as if 
We were never, ever here. Some of you have been a part of adoption. Some of you were adopted. Okay, we, we, we adopted. And it's that whole idea of taking someone who, who was here in a situation and bringing them into a new situation, into a new home, into a new life, with a new name, with a new start. And that's not by our effort, but it's through Jesus. It happens because our faith, we put our faith and trust in what he did. Good people don't go to heaven, forgiven people do. And so for some of you this morning, you've heard this and you go, Jimmy, heard it, got it, I'm good. I'm good. I know that, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that, that I needed Jesus and I gave my life to him because I know there's nothing that I could do that would ever, ever fix it. And I know I, I'm not good enough and I never will be. I know that. But some of you here today may not know that. Maybe this may be the first time you've heard it. Or you haven't believed it yet. You've still, you're str- still trying to earn your way to heaven. You're still trying to do enough good things to say, maybe, maybe, maybe God will love me if. Maybe God will love me if. Maybe God will love me if. Or some of you may be in the opposite place where you're going, there's no way that God can love me because of. There's no way that God can love me. There's no way that God can forgive me. There's no. Here's the deal. It's not, a, <laughs> it's not up to you. God loves you. And God knows that you're a sinner. And so what he said was, I don't want to leave you there. I don't want to leave you as a sinner. What I want to do is I want to offer you forgiveness. I want to offer you hope. I want to offer you a new life. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to take what really belongs to you, that death, that eternal death. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take it and I'm going to put it on myself. I'm going to put it on my son and I'm going to make him take it so that you now can experience eternal life, so that you now can experience a relationship with me, so that you now you now can live in the new kingdom, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of life, the kingdom of righteousness. You can live in God's kingdom. And it all starts with that very first thing. It all starts with that realization that we are sick, that we are broken, that we are sinners. If, if, you, don't, if you don't start there, then you don't need it. In your mind, you don't need it. Why would I need a savior? There's nothing wrong. Why would I need Jesus? I've got it. But the reality is, is that we're all broken. We all need a Savior. And so what I want to do in, in a minute is I, I just want to give you an opportunity to ask God for that forgiveness. And here's the deal. It's, it's, I can't do this for you. If I could, I would. Your, 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 your parents can't do this for you. Your husband, your wife, they can't do this for you. No one can do this. This has to be your decision. That has to be your words. This has to be something that from your heart that you say to God. And what do you say to him? The Bible says those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so you just cry out to him. You say, God, I know I'm a sinner. God, I know that there's nothing that I can do about that. And I believe that you you came into this world. You sent Jesus to die on a cross for my sins, to take care of what I couldn't take care of, to take the punishment that really belonged to me, God. You took it upon yourself so that I could have forgiveness. I believe that with all my heart. I want your forgiveness. I want your new life, God. I want to stop living my life in the kingdom of darkness. I want to stop living my life for the kingdom of self. What I want to do is I want to live my life for the kingdom of you. I want to live for your kingdom. That's, there's no magical words, but that's, that's got to be the heart of what you say and the heart of what you mean to God. So my hope and my prayer is, is that I pray that you will say, you will say yes to God, whatever that is, whether it's saying yes for salvation, maybe it's saying yes to to being a part of this church, maybe it's saying yes for a next step, maybe it's saying yes for a relationship that you got to go repair, maybe it's saying yes for someone that you have to go ask forgiveness for because you've been a jerk lately, maybe it's saying I'm sorry to your spouse, maybe it's saying I'm sorry to your kids, maybe it's saying I'm sorry to your parents, whatever it is, maybe whatever that is, I pray that you would say yes, say yes to God. And I pray that we would always remember that it's not our good works, but it's through salvation, through faith in Jesus Christ and what he's done.